Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks for coming to the second talk. It's been three days since the first one and in the meantime, we've had uh, many interesting lectures. So, so perhaps let me start by, oh, okay, by um, recalling what, what we discussed on Monday. So we were working in RN and this will be still the case for today's talk. Um, and we introduced two inequalities. So, the similarity um, between them was that on the right hand side we had the second moments of the Euclidean length of the gradient and on the left hand side we, we have variance for the Poincaré inequality and entropy of f squared for, for the log Sobolev inequality where entropy is defined by this common well-known formula. And um, then we, we Proved that Poincare implies sub-exponential concentration for Lipschitz functions, and uh, from log Sobolev you can get sub-Gaussian concentration. We also observed that, that both inequalities tensorized, uh, meaning that uh, if you can, uh, if you have them for, for a number of measures, um, then then also for their product on, on a bigger product space. And using this fact, this tensorization, we, we got to basic examples. So the standard Gaussian measure, which satisfies the log Sobolev inequality, and also Poincaré, because Poincaré is weaker, and the two-sided exponential product distribution, which, which satisfies just Poincaré. So these are the basic examples, like points of reference, but well, they are both products, so, so we may now try to, to find some non-product examples. And well, as, as we have seen in, in lectures by Boas, leaving this realm of uh, product measures, even under high regularity, like for log concave measures, creates uh, difficulties. It, it gets us into, into deep open problems. So um, let me start with uh, two easy facts, which are important from theoretical point of view, but are usually disappointing when you want to work with, um, maybe not always disappointing, but sometimes when we want to work with uh, uh, concrete measures that we are interested in. But nevertheless, they, they allow to produce new examples out of old ones. So the first is a proposition uh, saying that uh, both inequalities are preserved under bounded perturbations. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Uh, if we have some measure mu which satisfies either log Sobolev or Poincaré with constant c, and we have another measure which has density with respect to mu, and this density is separated from zero and from infinity. Um, so we can, we can write it in, in this form. Uh, and then it turns out that such a new measure also satisfies um, uh, well, log Sobolev or Poincaré respectively, but with constants related to oscillations of, of this exponent here. And th this is the place where it is disappointed because, well, um, especially in high dimensions, but also for natural examples in, in lower dimensions, uh, this, is, this is very restrictive. Right, but still, it can lead us very easily to non-product examples from product ones. Let me prove it. It's very, very simple. We, let's, let's do the Poincaré. So we, we start with the variance of f with respect to the new measure. We express variance as the infinimum of squared L2 distances to, to, to constant random variables, right? the, the usual formula. And then we, we use the density to pass to the measure mu bound the density by its supremum. Then we, we can see the variance with respect to mu. We apply Poincaré for mu uh, and then go back using the density in the other direction, right, to, um, uh, to go back to, to and, and here uh, exactly this oscillation appears. So, so this is, this is um, very, very simple. And for, for log Sobolev, I, I'm not going to to present the details, uh, it's an easy exercise to show that uh, the following variational formula holds just by differentiating. So, so you get exactly the same proof, but you just plug in this formula. So, so this is the first operation that uh, allows to, to create new examples. The second one uh, is also very easy, but here I would say that uh, when combined with deep results, it can lead to um, um, 
uh, new and uh, important uh, theorems. So uh, both inequalities are preserved under um, one Lipschitz transformation. So if you transform your random vector by one Lipschitz function, then the image will also satisfy inequalities with the same constant. And OK, I will just flash it for, for a second. You, of course, apply uh, the inequality for the old vector and the composition, calculate the, the gradient, um, bound the length with the operator norm, and use the fact that, in this case, the operator norm of the derivative is bounded by 1. So, so it is immediate, but um, uh, when combined with, with deep results like Caffarelli's uh, contraction principle, it, it can lead us to um, um, alternate proof of deep theorems. Uh, Boas mentioned it in one of his lectures. We will see it also in a moment. Okay, so let me just comment briefly that uh, uh, under additional convexity assumptions on mu, um, for instance, under log concavity, uh, there are better results uh, concerning this uh, perturbation with, with a density. So the, these were proved uh, a few years ago by Frank Barth and Emmanuel Milman, and they do not involve this L infinity type bounds on, um, uh, on this uh, density, but rather some LP type bounds, and um, the, the dependence is, is also better. So um, th this is more recent. Also, it's worth um, definitely worth mentioning that, well, it, it doesn't have to do anything with the product structure, but uh, it's worth mentioning that in dimension one, uh, both inequalities uh, have been characterized. Uh, there are explicit conditions um, on the measure which allow us to check if, if uh, the inequalities hold. And uh, for Lok Sobolev, it's in the famous paper by Bobkov and Goetze. I'm not sure who did it first for Poincaré, either I think Mazaya or perhaps it's going back to Muchenhaupt. In any case, these are uh, all based on um, Muchenhaupt's characterizations on Hardy type inequalities. And I'm not going to prove it, but, but perhaps um, it's uh, if, if well, most probably most of you have, have seen it many times, but for students, uh, it's perhaps good to see what, um, what such a condition may look like. So we have a measure of mu on R, then the log Sobolev inequality is characterized in terms of finiteness of two numbers, and they are somewhat um, they are very similar, analogous one to another, but one considers the left tail below the median and the other one the right tail. So it's some interplay, a condition on the interplay on the tail and integral of um, one over P, where P is the density of the absolutely continuous part. So, so maybe let me just comment that um, the fact that um, such a quantity appears here, something of this sort, is not very surprising because um, obviously if, if we had some gaps in the support of our measure, then we could um, consider a function which would take just two values on, uh, on the support uh, and would be constant, uh, constant on, on uh, two um, connected components, say, of, of this support, then, of course, the right-hand side um, would be, um, of our inequalities would be zero, the gradient would be zero almost everywhere with respect to the measure, but the function would not be constant, so the left-hand side would not be zero, right? So, so uh, this, in some sense, reflects the, the, the fact that we cannot have holes uh, in, in uh, our support, but I'm not going to get um, more deeply into this, let me maybe comment that on for other functional inequalities, there are also characterizations like Frank Barth and Cyril Roberto did it for, for, for many other functional inequalities on the ground. Okay, and we should go back to Rn and we will um, consider an important criterion which uh, appeared already in um, lectures by Boas, uh, the, the Bakri Emery condition. Uh, which is, in fact, a, a part of a more general theory involving semigroups, but I would like to stick to Rn. So it tells us that we have the log of inequality 
for measures which are strongly log concave, meaning that they are more log concave than um, some Gaussian measure. Right? So, so this is um, formally reflected at the level of the Hessian of this potential here. Right? So the Hessian should, uh, um, should be greater than some positive multiple of identity, the identity of the matrix in the semi-definite order, right? And this, this is just uh, the Hessian of the potential of the Gaussian potential, right? So, so in this sense, this is more, more convex than, than the quadratic potential. And then under this assumption, you satisfy this um, um, log Sobolev inequality. Uh, then, of course, uh, the Poincaré inequality also follows. So, so Bas was speaking about the Poincaré inequality under these types of condition. Mm. OK, so as I mentioned, the standard proof is by semigroup methods. Um, there are also, I think, some um, stochastic calculus approaches. Another possibility, and this is what Boas mentioned um, when, when speaking about isoperimetry, um, another possibility is Caffarelli's contraction principle. So, so this principle is telling us exactly that mu is a Lipschitz image of, of a Gaussian measure. So, so we can transport uh, the inequality from, from the known Gaussian case. But this is, this is a, a, a very deep result, right? So recently the, there have been several new and easier proof, I think by uh, Emmanuel and uh, also by Natal Goslan and co-authors. So I would like to present a proof um, um, of Bobkov and Ledoux, which is based on the precopa Leindler inequality. So, so uh, one of the reasons um, for, for this choice is that I believe that precopa Langler inequality fits well into the um, topic of, of uh, this program. And also um, it will lead us to certain generalizations, but for the moment I will stick to this formulation. So let's recall the precopa Langler inequality. Uh, so it concerns three non-negative functions and well, a fixed weight for which um, the following pointwise inequality holds. So the value of the function h at uh, the convex combination with weights uh, one minus lambda lambda of two points is greater than this um, geometric mean of them also with, with these weights. And if you have such an assumption, then the precopa Langler inequality tells us that we have a similar inequality on integrals. So this is, of course, uh, one of the basic tools in the theory of log concave measures. And uh, I, I'm sure that uh, you, especially those who, who work uh, more on the geometric side, know um, this stuff much better than I do. But let me comment, nonetheless, that it can be considered a functional version of the brun minkowski inequality. So, um, uh, an exercise to let's say newcomers is to, to use this inequality to prove Bruninkowski. And uh, if I have time at the end of this talk, but probably I won't, um, I, but I, I will show um, this uh, uh, simple inductive proof um, due to Keith Ball. Uh, if not, that you can find it in, in this book by Kizia and also, well, the, the slides will be uploaded to the web page. So it's just, it's just two slides. Um, it's really worth, worth seeing. Okay, but um, going back to the proof of the um, um, bakri emery criterion, we're going to need another lemma, which I will not prove, it, it's just a differentiation. So it tells us that we have, if we have a bounded variable and we look at the moment function, then when we differentiate it, then we will see entropy in it. So I, I hope this formula is correct. I, I did the differentiation quickly. Uh -huh. In any case, what we are going to use is that um, um, the derivative at one is just the entropy of, of x. So um, precopalandler inequality and this observation are the two main ingredients of the proof. And let's go to the proof. 
So first, we are going to rephrase the Bakri emery assumption. So we've already said that uh, it is just convexity of, of u minus this um, quadratic function. And then if you just use the definition of convexity for this new function, well, use the fact that you, you can expand, you can raise to this power two and do some algebraic manipulation and to rearrange the terms, you will end up with, with such, a, such an inequality. Right? So, so th this is just some manipulation with symbols. And now we're going to prove our log stability inequality for positive f, which can be written in this form, like e to g over two for some smooth g with compact support. Later, I will comment briefly on how to extend this um, to, to more general functions. So you want to apply the Poincar, uh, sorry, the Prokopal angular inequality. So, so well, we need three functions. So we want to see moments somewhere there. So, and we have T between zero and one. So we will see moments of order one over T at, at some um, point. So here we have just E to moments of F squared. So we have E to G over T right, minus u so that we, we have the density incorporated in, in the function which we are going to integrate. Then this is just our density. And here for w, so, so perhaps I, I should have used the same notation, the formulation of the Prokopal angular inequality. These are the functions uh, on the left and w is supposed to majorize uh, th those values uh, of, of u and v. So for w, we choose the, the minimal function that uh, allows us to apply the um, Prokopal angular inequality. So in Prokopal angular, we had a geometric mean of, of these values, which translates into arithmetic mean of, um, we're going to use it with parameter t, translates into a, a, um, arithmetic um, mean of um, um, I mean, convex combination of these exponents. And what we have here is just the choice of this function gt, which allows us to uh, use uh, Prokopal angular. So, so please just note that here it's written as a supremum over a complicated expression, but this last argument here is just Z and it actually appears with plus on the right-hand side, to minuses. So when we move it back here, we will exactly get this, this exponent. And I'm right, so, so this is just the definition which, which makes Prokopal angular work. And I wrote it in this form to be able to refer to our formula at the top here and replace it immediately with, with a simpler expression. So, so um, in what follows, we, we are not going really to use this definition, but just the, the inequality. So when you plug these three functions into Prokopal angular, you will get, well, on the um, left-hand side, you will get uh, the integral of this function, which thanks to our weight or density translates into the expectation uh, with respect to mu. On the right hand side, well, again, we get this expectation and the integral should be to the power t. So we see that it's the moment of order one over t of, of our f squared and the other um, integral will just give one because mu is, this is the density and we do probability measures. So, so let me move this um, two parts that we are going to need to the next slide. And now let's, so these are the two inequalities. Let's look at the, the second one. So here Z is a convex uh, combination of X and Y. So for fixed T, of course, uh, well, if we know Z and Y, we can express both X and X minus Y in terms of Z and Y. And this is how you do it explicitly. And you see that, uh, well, when t approaches one, so we can think of x uh, here as some, let's say, for fixed y at least, not, not too big perturbation of z. 
right? And here also z minus y p plus. So now we use instead we use this formula for x here, and we use Tyler's expansion and. Uh, we have a uniform remainder because uh, G had compact support, right? So when you um, use the, the remainder and uh, so the remainder in Lagrange form, it should be the square of one minus T over T. So it's already rearranged. Like here you have one minus T over T, here you have another one minus T over T. Moreover, if you replace this X minus Y by the this expression, then you will also get one minus t over t. So, so this is uh, uh, what what allows you to to move this factor outside the supremum. And now, when we look at this supremum, so so our goal is to uh, further bound it because this is the left hand side of our inequality. This is where where this function appears. When we look at the supremum, we see that well, well y runs over the whole space. This is this is in fact the Legendre transform of this square of the norm well, scaled. Uh, and well, this is this is positive for for um, t um, uh, t uh, sufficiently close to. One. Right, so so well, we know how to calculate Legend transforms of, of such functions, and uh, when you do it, you will actually get twice times this number in the uh, denominator. But again, for t close to one, you can use another Tyler's expansion to to leave only this two uh, c right in the in the, uh, in the denominator. So so this proof actually. It, it, it's a very nice idea, but uh, it uses Tyler's expansion like several times, really. So this is perhaps a little bit unpleasant at the technical level, but other than that, this, this is a very clear uh, and nice idea to start with this um, precopalangular inequality. So, so you will get such a bound, right? That, the remainder will be of this form. And now you again use Tyler's expansion, this time of the exponent at the point G of Z, right? So when you again use Tyler's expansion, you will get and integrate. Now I, I did two steps at, at once. You will see something like that, right? This E to G is the derivative. Okay, so this is the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have this moment of order one over T. So this is, what we have. So, so uh, this is one inequality, but at the same time, when we expand moments at one, right, with the Tyler's expansion at one, then we will also see entropy. Let's recall that the derivative was uh, at one of, of the moment function was, was exactly the entropy. Here we have the moment of order one over T. So it will come with minus, which is good because it turns out that we have the same expressions on both the left and right hand sides. And now you see the cancellations, right? You just let t goes go to one, and uh, and you arrived at this inequality. So then, when you go back to the definition of g and its relation with f squared, this gives the the usual form of the log sub f inequality. For functions f which are positive, sorry, which are positive, so passing to general f is you can do it by some just some approximations to get first non-negative functions, and then you just use the fact that uh, um, passing from f to the absolute value of f will not change the entropy of f squared, and actually will introduce some contraction on the right hand side because uh, I mean because of the contractivity of the absolute value. And for, for you don't have smooth functions here, but uh, local ellipses functions. So, so it's okay. Like we have differentiability almost everywhere. So um, you, you can just use it to, to pass from such positive functions to, to all of them. Okay, so, so um, this, is, this is the full proof of, of this uh, Bakri-Emery condition. And in fact, when you look at it, um, 
you will see that it, in fact, it works in a greater generality. And this is actually what Popkov and Ledoux were using in their paper. This is how they formulated it. So our starting point was such an inequality for the Euclidean norm here on the right-hand side. And then it was equivalent just to this uh, condition on, on the positivity of, of the Hessian. Uh, but you can start just abstractly with, with this condition with a different norm here. And then the whole um, argument goes through. The, the only difference is, is that uh, at the end you, you will have, um, um, you, you will have the um, log sobel of inequality with the right hand side uh, involving not the Euclidean length of the gradient, but the dual norm of the gradient, dual to the, to the norm that we started with. And then you can, um, for example, run the Herbst argument starting with this inequality and obtained, obtain um, concentration, sub Gaussian concentration for functions which are Lipschitz with respect to, to our. Uh, norm, uh, which corresponds to, to having this uh, dual norm of the gradient bounded um, everywhere but from, from the Lipschitz condition. So such inequalities, um, I think they were considered first by, by Bobkov and Ledoux. Uh, so inequalities in which we have entropy of F squared on the left-hand side, but we have something else that the um, uh, second moment of the Euclidean norm of the gradient on the right hand side. So out of this, uh, it grew into a, a whole business um, earlier, right? And uh, uh, these are called usually modified log Sobolev inequalities. And uh, this, is, this is the second reason why I chose this proof because it moves us into um, this topic of modified log Sobolev inequalities which sometimes can lead to improvements of the usual concentration that you can get from example from the Poincaré inequality. And, and this is what I would like to discuss now. Uh, it will be still connected to the work, I think older work by, by uh, Bobkov and Ledoux. Uh, I would like to describe this phenomenon uh, using again the um, exponential distribution. So we know from the, from the first lecture that this distribution satisfies the Poincaré inequality. And therefore it, uh, it satisfies sub-exponential concentration, but of course it does not satisfy sub-Gaussian concentration. Uh, and we may ask, well, on the one hand, we, we know that the sub-exponential is the best you can get because when you look at a single coordinate, it, it, it exactly has the exponential distribution. So it has sub-exponential tails. But we may ask if for, under some additional knowledge about the function, if we can get something better. And the test function that illustrates it very well is this CLT type test function. So as a function of X with respect to the Euclidean norm, this is one Lipschitz. So, so we get the tail of the form E2 minus T right, from the Poincaré inequality. At the same time, exactly by, by the central limit theorem, it's in the limit when the dimension tends to infinity, this tends to, to a standard Gaussian variable, right? So, so we could expect some Gaussian behavior. Of course, the CLT gives us just the weak convergence. So from this, we cannot say anything about the tail. But it turns out that there are classical inequalities in probability which allow to handle this function. So, so I mean, Bernstein inequality in its um, psi one form, maybe let me write it for you. So we have maybe in the IAD case, these are IAD of mean zero. And let's assume, say that X one over some kappa is smaller than two such exponential moments exist. So, okay, in, in terms of Orlich spaces, so the usual notation, I'm not going to use it, but this corresponds to, to the finiteness of the Psi-1 Orlich norm. And then Bernstein's inequality, which follows just from the general form of Bernstein's inequality as a special case, 
tells us that this is bounded by some constant, the square over n kappa square minimum. This is stands for the minimum with k over kappa. Okay, so, so it resembles the classical Bernstein inequality for bounded variables, except that uh, in the bounded case, here instead of kappa, we have uh, the L infinity norm of our variables, and here we have the variance. But it follows from the moment, um, the version of Bernstein's inequality um, with assumptions expressed in terms of the growth of moments. Uh, so, so this is how one usually proves it. So when we apply it here, Take into a fact that for the for our variables, our coordinates, this kappa is just a constant, and then this take into account the scaling, we will get the tail behavior of this form. So when compared with e to minus ct obtained from Poincaré, we see that we get an improvement. This is always better, and moreover, when t uh, sorry when n tends to infinity, we will get this sub Gaussian behavior in this uh, window of growing size, right? It grows nicely with the, with the dimension. So in, in some sense, it, one can say that it, it indeed reflects the um, central limit behavior. Right? Uh, in, in this situation, the variance in fact, and the, um, is, well, the variance is fixed also. Okay, so we may now ask if this is, if such an improved concentration is just a coincidence because we conveniently chose a sum of independent random variables and then we used classical probability theory, or perhaps there is something deeper here at the level of uh, general functions and concentration um, for, under some additional assumptions. And it turns out that this is indeed the case. The reason for this improved concentration is that our function has small Lipschitz norm, with small Lipschitz constant with respect to the L1 norm. And this, the reciprocal of the Lipschitz constant is, is exactly what, what we have here. So, so in fact, here we have T square over the um, Lipschitz constant uh, with respect to the Euclidean norm squared. And here we have T over um, the L1 Lipschitz constant. And this was first observed by Talagrand, uh, and uh, quite soon uh, Moret proposed uh, an alternate proof, which, which turned out to be very influential. It was based on uh, infimum convolution inequalities. And uh, well, there is a whole story starting from then, there and linking to um, optimal transportation, but I'm not going to, to speak about it. I, I, I will describe a proof due to Bobkov and Ledoux using modified Luxembourg inequalities. And this is the proof that gives these constants. So, so let me state the inequality again. If, if we have a function which is Lipschitz and we, well, of course, if we just say that it's Lipschitz in fixed dimension, all norms are equivalent. So it is Lipschitz with respect to each norm, but this is a high dimensional statement. So, so the equivalence between norms deteriorates. And if we control the Lipschitz constant with respect to the Euclidean norm and the Lipschitz constant with respect to the L1 norm, which is this supremum of the L infinity norm of the gradient, right? So, so this is the uh, sequential L infinity, of course, right? The supremum is here. Then we have such an inequality. And if you note that uh, B is always smaller than A, then you will see that, that this is up to constants. Well, this is smaller than E to minus C T. So, so uh, C T over A. So this improves always uh, uh, on, on what, what you can get from the Poincaré inequality. And uh, as we saw here, it may improve substantially. So, so let me show how, how this is proved. So this is the inequality uh, obtained by, by Bobkov and Ledoux. And it looks almost like the usual Loxobolev inequality, except that it holds for a um, restricted class of functions. So it, we know that the, um, uh, the exponential measure cannot satisfy the usual Luxembourg inequality, but it turns out that uh, if the function is, um, has gradient bounded by C, which is smaller than one, and by a function, I mean 
a function in the exponent. So it is convenient to write the inequality in this form, not for f squared, but to e to the f. Then we have the log sub f inequality. Well, with, with a constant which uh, explodes at one, of course, it has to explode somewhere. Right. So, so how does it imply, maybe let me discuss first how it implies uh, this two-level concentration. Well, this is very easy. Mm, you apply this inequality, for example, with c equal to one half. And this allows you to mm, apply the, the argument um, by Herbst, right, which was uh, applying this inequality to, to lambda f instead of um, f. But provided that lambda f, the, the infinity norm of the gradient is smaller than c. So for a restricted range of lambda. Anyway, if you remember this Herbst argument, it led to a differential inequality and then a bound on the Laplace transform of, of our centered random variable. And we get exactly the same, except that uh, not, not for all positive lambda, but uh, on, on some interval. And now those of you who have ever done the proof of Bernstein's inequality will, will immediately see the similarity here. So, so it's like the Gaussian bound on the Laplace transform, but restricted to an interval will give us something like the mixed uh, Gaussian exponential behavior after optimization of, of the Chebyshev inequality in lambda. Okay, so, so the, the argument is, is again the same. Mm. So, so le let me now mm, sketch the, the proof of this mm, log sub of inequality by Bobkov and Ledoux. So, so this is the formulation again. And well, our assumption that the maximum of partial derivatives is uh, smaller than C is exactly what allows uh, for tensorization. So if you have this assumption and you know how to, for the product measure, and you know how to prove the inequality for the one dimensional marginals, then, then this assumption is exactly what allows you to um, apply the inequality in, in the directions given by this independent structure. So, so because of this, it's enough to, to, to treat the case n equal to one. And then again, by homogeneity, we can assume that f of zero equals zero. Okay. And now we want to bound entropy of e to f. Well, this is this entropy of e to f. And using some, some well, supporting function for, for u log u, we, we replace this entropy by, by a more convenient expression, which, which contains only one, uh, we, we can put it under one expectation. And then this, I should say, resembles uh, very closely the, the proof of the Poincaré inequality for the exponential distribution. Because you may recall that, it, I'm not going to write it again, but we have, uh, um, when you take the density of the one dimensional exponential distribution into account, you, you will have an integration by parts formula um, involving the sign of, of X in, in probabilistic terms, it's when it is implied, implied, applied, sorry, applied for um, this um, function, it gives something like that right after you differentiate. And here we just use Cauchy Schwarz. So um, we see our right-hand side, the, the, the thing that we are after here, and also this other expression, which we need to handle. So to handle this other expression, we again use um, integration by parts. Now the derivative will give us two terms. The first one is the same as we saw before. So we again use uh, Cauchy Schwarz. For the second one, we cannot use Cauchy Schwarz because uh, the, the power of f is too, um, uh, too large. Oh, I should perhaps say, uh, probably everyone sees it, but uh, um, we, when using Cauchy Schwarz, we split this e to f, right? Or, or you can say that you use Cauchy Schwarz for this weight. Okay. But here we have f squared. We, we cannot use Cauchy Schwarz, but we can finally take advantage of our assumption. This f prime in absolute value is at most c, and c is smaller than one. So altogether, we have the left-hand side appearing twice on the right-hand side with a smaller than one refactor and in, in a power smaller than one. 
right? So, so we can solve this inequality from the left hand side. So it, it will lead you such leads to such an estimate. So this is exactly what we wanted on the right hand side of the modified log Sobolev inequality. And now the inequality we had before at the end of the previous slide was, was this one, right? When we plug in this thing for, for the second term, this, this square root will in fact improve things too. Um, oh, I, I lost two, right? So there, there, there should be probably two here. We may go back and check if this is, if this is the case. Um, if, um, sorry, I can't put somehow. Okay, it seems that I lost, I lost, um, okay, it's, it's here that I lost uh, two, right? The, there should be four here, right? Because if I'm not mistaken, it, it doesn't matter much than the idea, I hope is, um, is clear, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so, let me just mention that Bobkov and Ledoux obtained a more general statement valid even for, for metric statement, uh, met metric spaces and um, some appropriate length of the gradient, but let me specialize to our end here. So it turns out that whenever we have the Poincaré inequality, we actually have such, let's call it log Sobolev inequality restricted to functions with small derivatives. The difference here is that we we treat this, it in a sense corresponds to n equal to one for um, exponential, the exponential product measure, uh, because uh, this is in some sense a starting point for the uh, tensorization. So, so we use it just in this dimension. And uh, so, so we bound the winged an assumption on the Euclidean length of the gradient. But then when you go to higher dimensions, n times n, this inequality tensorizes and you will get an inequality for two-level inequality for functions which are Lipschitz with respect to the Euclidean norm and Lipschitz uh, with respect to some mixture of um, L, uh, L1 and L2 norm. So if you don't care in such inequalities, if you don't care about the de dependence on little n, you treat it as your, your basic measure in some sense, then you can transform it up to constants depending on this little n into the same inequality as we saw before, like the L2 norm of the gradient and L infinity norm of the gradient. Okay, and I just have a few minutes now. So let me just mention very briefly that this has been generalized by Jean Tilgilen and Miquelon to, well, there are even more general formulation. This is a formulation which is obtained from dimension one and tensorized. So an inequality of this form, it may look kind of strange at first, this denominator um, f here. Uh, phi is some just some Young or Orlich function, if you wish. Let me just show you briefly um, how, how it corresponds to the inequalities that we have seen, because this formulation is, is very general. So when you plug in, phi of x equal to x square, then f square from the denominator will cancel and we will just get the, the, after the summation, the square of the Euclidean norm of the gradient. So we will get the usual log Sobolev inequality. At the same time, if you take this function, um, then, well, it makes sense only, it gives something non-trivial only if this um, logarithmic derivative here is smaller than C, and it corresponds then when you write it in, in a different form uh, to exactly to the Bobkov Ledoux inequality, maybe not at its uh, full strength with this constant one over one minus C, but for fixed C. Anyway, this is enough to, to lead to this two level concentration. And I'm mentioning it because, for example, for like we have Poincare, which implies. Uh, exponential concentration, log Sobolev, which implies um, sub-Gaussian concentration. And if you plug uh, this in for, if you plug in such a function, so it's of course, it's not a convex function, but it's equivalent in an appropriate sense to convex function. I mean, a convex function, which grows first like x square and then like x to alpha 
star this is the elders conjugate for alpha between one and two so it grows more rapidly than, than gaussian than, than this, the square function then it turns out that this inequality is satisfied for such viable distributions and you will get an inequality of this type so it is expressed in terms of um, the euclidean and um, okay I'm, I will, let me take two minutes and I will finish uh, the Euclidean and the um, alpha star norm. So, so you can check that it somehow interpolates between the Lok Sobolev and Poincare case because these two expressions coincide uh, for alpha equal to two. And this one is the Ellen norm of the gradient uh, to power one for, for alpha equal to one. So, so let me just um, conclude with, with some final remarks concerning such uh, two-level or exponential um, um, general concentration, which is independent of the dimension. So if we have any non-trivial measure and we are interested in concentration, which uh, for, for one Lipschitz functions, uh, which is dimension independent, and it is some non-trivial concentration, then well, any concentration cannot be better than the Gaussian one because of the central limit theory, right? unless the, the measure is trivial. Then Talagrand proved that by some nice tensorization trick that if we have any concentration, any function here, which uh, tends to zero at infinity or even weaker assumptions are possible, then we can improve it to sub-exponential concentration. So concent Dimension free concentration is always between sub exponential and sub Gaussian. And in fact, quite recently, Goslan, Roberto, and Samson proved that dimension free concentration is equivalent to the Poincare inequality. So, so in some sense, those, um, well, so, so then it is also, it turns out that it is equivalent to this Bobkov Ledoux inequality. For um, sub Gaussian concentration, it's not equivalent to the uh, log Sobolev inequality by a result by Samson, it's equivalent to some transportation cost inequality due to Talagrand. And this Poincare inequality by a result by, I think, Bobkov, Gentil, and Ledoux is also equivalent to a transportation inequality, but this is another story. So, okay, uh, sorry for, for taking this two and a half minutes more. Uh, th this I will skip, this is the promise, but not fulfilled promise um, proof of the Precopalangler inequality. You can check it out. The, the slides will be available. So thank you, let me stop. Thanks a lot.